um, who is a professor, group leader and professorial fellow at Keble College at the University of Oxford. Um, very, been very loyal to Oxbridge, uh, did his degree at Oxford and then PhD at Cam Cambridge where he worked with Professor Jeremy Sanders and is now based in the chemistry department at Oxford and his areas of research are molecular materials, material synthesis, polymers, dyes and supramolecular chemistry and his talk tonight focuses on molecular nanostructures with unusual properties. Okay, so I'll pass, pass over to you, thanks. Thank you, well thanks very much for inviting me, I'm pleased to be able to tell you about some of the work my group's been doing on the creation of molecular nanostructures. I think the most exciting thing about chemistry is that you can create molecules and structures that have never existed before. And you can easily be overwhelmed by the choice of structures to make. There are just so many molecules you could potentially make. And I think a good guide is to try to make the molecules uh, and materials that you think will have the most unusual properties so you can investigate them and, and learn whether your predictions are right. So today I'm going to talk um, about molecules that we've been making uh, with unusual electronic uh, and optical, although I won't talk about optical much, unusual electronic properties and particularly molecules that can behave like molecular wires. Um, so I thought I'd go straight in to explain how we can measure the conductance of a single molecule. So it, it, it seems amazing that you can put a molecule, a single molecule between two electrodes um, to connect it up and, and you can actually measure its, its conductance which is just one over the resistance. Um, and I, I guess when I did my PhD, that wasn't possible. Um, but now it's a very routine technique. You can easily measure the conductance fairly accurately of, of different molecules. And one of the most reliable ways of doing it is using STM, and so scanning tunneling microscopy. Now how that works is that you have a, a gold surface and a gold STM tip, and you bring the tip down um, so that it makes contact and actually welds, the gold welds together. Um, and then you pull the tip away. And as you pull it away, you pull out a, um, a little string of gold atoms, uh, which breaks. And while you do that, you measure um, the, um, the conductance of, of the junction. And so if you plot log of conductance again, against displacement, you get a straight line like this. Um, in other words, the conductance falls off exponentially with distance because it's a tunneling process. Um, so that's what you get if you have no molecules, you're just breaking a junction. Um, but if you have a molecule present or, or a, a solution of a compound, uh, then the molecules can stick onto the surface of both the tip and, and the substrate. And then when you pull the tip away from the substrate, you sometimes get a molecule bridging the gap um, between the tip and the surface so that a current can flow through that molecule. And so if again you plot the log of the conductance against the distance, you now get a, a plateau of a fairly constant sort of uh, conductance where the current is flowing through the molecule. And that plateau extends to a certain distance at which the molecule breaks off. So from these measurements, you get two bits of information, the conductance of the molecule and the length of the molecule. Uh, but every time you do that, you get a different answer because the molecule can be in a slightly different orientation. It might be connecting to a different sort of atom on the gold surface. So you have to do it thousands of times and take an average. So in practice, you get a histogram like this, where the, the color here shows this, this plateau for uh, thousands of retractions. And this can be done for many different types of molecules. And one of the interesting questions is, how does the conductance of a molecule depend on its length? As you make the molecule longer, how does that change the, the conductance? And the simplest model is that conductance occurs by a tunneling process. That means the electron doesn't have enough energy to populate states on the, the molecular wire but the molecular wire um, facilitates tunneling through the gap. Um, and the tunneling process normally falls off exponentially with distance. So you expect the conductance, GM, to depend uh, exponentially on distance, decreasing exponentially with distance. 
uh, quantified by this beta attenuation factor. So beta says how quickly the conductance falls off with the length of the molecule. And so you can measure beta for different types of molecules. And you find that uh, saturated ones have a, a larger beta. That means a, a more rapid fall off of conductance with length than pi conjugated ones. And the easiest way of understanding this beta attenuation factor is for a, a really simple model, like a rectangular tunneling barrier. Uh, beta depends on the square root of the energy gap for the, or the, the height of the barrier, the, the height, which is really the energy gap between the, the homo and the lumo on the molecule. So to a first approximation, how easily uh, electrons can flow through a molecule depends on the energy gap between the highest occupied molecular orbital and the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. Um, so if we think about that in some simple molecules like ethene, the, the homo lumo gap is just the pi to pi star gap. And if you join uh, ethene units together and make a conjugated oligomer starting off with butadiene, you get a smaller homo lumo gap. So that the uh, H nu, the light absorbed, would be longer wavelength, uh, smaller energy as the conjugation increases, as the length of the pi system increases. Uh, and if you go to a very long polymer, then you have so many, en many energy levels that rather than considering rather than considering discrete energy levels, you have to have a band diagram where you consider the, the uh, density of states in a particular energy increment. And if all the bond lengths along this chain were equal, as shown by this sort of dotted line here, then uh, you'd get one half full band. The material would be a, a metallic conductor because it would have a non-zero density of states at the Fermi level. But actually that's not a good description of a, a very long conjugated chain. In fact, you have alternating long and, and short double bonds along the chain, and that results in, in, in a gap. That, that sort of distortion is known as a pilus distortion, um, and it breaks the band into a full pi band and an empty pi star band separated by a gap. Um, and, and that gap has a strong effect on the conductance of the single molecules. And you can see how this works from some experimental data. If you look here, these are the um, absorption wavelengths of a series of oligoenes or, or polyenes uh, plotted against the number of carbon atoms in the chain. So as the number of carbon atoms gets bigger, as it gets longer, the uh, lambda max, the absorption wavelength shifts to uh, a longer wavelength um, asymptotically towards a particular wavelength for an infinitely long chain. And you, you can see that asymptotic behavior better if you plot one over the number of carbon atoms against one over the um, absorption wavelength, or in other words, the absorption energy. So this is just the same data uh, replotted as one over the number of atoms against the energy. And now you can extrapolate to the intercept here, which is the energy you'd expect for an infinitely long chain. So it doesn't extrapolate to zero, it extrapolates to a significant um, band gap because of that piles distortion. But not all molecules show this. Uh, an interesting class of molecules that don't show this effect are known as the cyanins. So these are molecules where you have alternating double and single bonds, just like a polyene, except that you've got a, a nitrogen with a double bond and a positive charge at one end, and a nitrogen with a lone pair at the other end. And that arrangement of nitrogens means that you have two equal energy resonance structures as shown there. So in other words, you don't any longer have bond length alternation because the true situation is an is a, is a average equally weighted between those two extremes, which have bonds in the opposite positions. So perhaps a better representation is, is shown here with no bond length alternation. And that's why uh, the electronic structure behaves much more like an electron in a one dimensional box, a very, very simple electron gas model and the, um, the, the pi to pi star energy gap just increases almost linearly to almost zero at infinite chain. Um, but this is a, a, a funny uh, sort of paradoxical result because if you had an infinite chain of this sort, then surely it would be the same as a polyene. If it's an infinite chain, the end groups can't have any effect and the, the middle of the chain is identical for a polyene and a cyanine. So actually what must happen is that there's a, 
uh, distortion and piles distortion must come in at a certain length so that the energy curves meet at, at the infinite chain. And uh, in a few moments, I'll show you some molecules that illustrate this happening. So let's go back to this idea of the beta attenuation factor that controls how the conductance falls off in long molecules. And I'll show you some experimental data to show you how we measure beta. So these are some molecules um, not made by my research group, made, made by another group that just show you how increasing the length of a molecule with sulfur end groups. And I should have mentioned sulfur is often used as the end groups because it binds strongly to gold. So these molecules are just a homologous family of oligomers of increasing length. And you can measure the conductance and see how the conductance falls off with length. And if you plot the log of the conductance against the length, you get a nice, really perfectly straight line from which you can determine the beta factor is um, three reciprocal nanometers. And notice that this is a log scale. So the, the conductance is falling off really dramatically. So between one oligomer and the next, you're going down about one unit on a log scale, a factor of 10. So an order of magnitude less conductive every time you increase the chain. And perhaps that illustrates why we want to make molecules that don't decline so steeply in their conductance because they'd be useful in all sorts of devices if you could have a longer molecular wire that wasn't of a, a really high resistance. Um, so recently, we, in my group, we've been looking at cyanins uh, as molecular wires, and we've made this family of, of cyanins so that they're basically the same as the structure I just showed you, but they've got benzenes and sulfurs at the ends for connecting to gold electrodes. So they're a homologous series of increasingly long cyanins. And um, we measured their conductance. And now if you plot um, the log of the conductance against the length you can see that at least for the first four members of this series, the conductance is almost completely independent of length. It's almost a horizontal line, a very small attenuation. But interest, interestingly, the longest one does start to fall in its conductance. And I think that's because once you get beyond a certain length, you do get the piles distortion coming in and, and, it, and it distorts. And you can see that from the crystal structures. So these are the crystal structures of the molecules um, they're the three longest in the series. And um, these uh, histograms, or the, the bar diagrams, show the length of each of the bonds along the pi system. So uh, the top one, the shortest of the three, there's no bond length alternation. The middle one, again, there's really no bond length alternation. The bond lengths are pretty constant all the way along this chain. There's just a little bit of random variation in the crystal structure. But the longest one, you can see now on the, at least the right end of the molecule, there's a, a strong alternation in the bond length. So the piles distortion is, is definitely coming in here. Um, and that uh, increases the homolimo gap and, and decreases the, the conductance. Um, so I've talked about um, various simple pi systems, but the, the rest of the talk will be about porphyrins. Um, they're one of the, the favorite molecules that we work in my group. Um, they're naturally occurring um, flat aromatic molecules that are responsible for the color of uh, green plants in chlorophyll and blood in hemoglobin. So they're really important naturally occurring molecules. Um, but they're, they're also largely localized pi systems, and we found that they're good components for making molecular wires uh, completely synthetically. Um, just to show you um, a bit of the background to these molecules, I thought I should show you how we do the synthesis. We make the porphyrins from pyrrole, from, from scratch, by condensing it with formaldehyde to form a dipyromethane, and then that's condensed with benzaldehyde to form a diaryl porphyrin. And then often we brominate them and do a palladium catalyzed Sonogashira coupling to put on these acetylenes, and then we link the acetylenes together to make molecular wires. And we use um, different solubilizing groups. These AR here is an is a aryl solubilizing group. Um, and the, the ditibutyl aryl is very good for growing crystals. Um, and the, the bis trihexyl silyl is very good for solubility. And the, the dioctyl oxy is sort of in between. Sometimes people think that uh, porphyrins tend to be very insoluble compounds that you can only make in small amounts in low yield. Um, but notice here, you can make these compounds on a pretty good yield and 70% 70, 70 yield for making the porphyrin there. And you can make them on a large scale uh, we make a, a 10 gram batch and 
for this compound with the triaxosal groups, 10 grams is actually 10 mil. It's, and it's a liquid at room temperature, uh, and it's extremely soluble in, in organic solvents. Um, so we, that's because we've got these really bulky triaxosal groups. So we use these liquid porphyrins as, as building blocks because they can give you such soluble materials. Um, so that we link them together we're often with butadienes. These are cetylenic units as shown in this crystal structure of the dimer. You can see the, the porphyrins here are coplanar, forming a large extended pi system, um, whereas the aryl groups on the sides are twisted and they're not, not really part of the pi system. And in this case, we've got these trihexyl salar groups just as protecting groups on the end of the chain. And we can take those off and, and join them together. The smaller oligomers, we can generally get X-ray crystal structures of to determine the shapes. The larger ones, we tend to rely on STM. So here's a STM image of a hexama, a linear hexama that's been deposited on a gold surface by electrospray under vacuum. So you no longer have atomic resolution, but you have porphyrin resolution. So each of these blobs is a porphyrin, and the distance between the porphyrins is, is just the same as it was in the crystal structure of the dimer that I just showed you. Uh, if you look at longer chains, you can see that they're quite flexible. So this is an analogous image of uh, a, a polymer, the um, polydispersed polymer of about 40 repeat units on a gold surface. And I don't know how well you can see, but there, you can just about resolve the porphyrin centers and they form long curving chains on the surface. So the longer chains are quite flexible. Um, so they're, they're basically rod-like uh, chains, but they're also pi conjugated as you can see from the calculated molecular orbitals, you can see from the LUMO that there's a bonding interaction at the center, stabilizing the LUMO of the dimer and um, an antibonding in the middle of the HOMO, uh, destabilizing the HOMO so that reduces the HOMO-LUMO gap. And that, that's just a calculated result, but you can see it very immediately by looking at the colors of these compounds in the absorption spectra. So if you compare the absorption spectrum in solution of the monomer, so that's the chain with N equals one, with the dimer, you get a dramatic uh, redshift. That means the pi to pi star gap is getting smaller. It means they're conjugated. And you carry on up to the hexma, you see a, a progressive redshift. And plotting one over lambda max against one over the number of porphyrin units gives a straight line. And that shows you that the, um, the delocalization length in the excited state is, is over many units. So they're, they're highly pi conjugated. Um, so we've been investigating these compounds, uh, oh, before I go on to that, the band structures also show you the conjugation. Um, so um, the band structure of the butadiene linked to ligama has um, a small but, well, significant band gap. So this is just like the situation with a polyene where you have a, a, a piles distortion leading to this uh, gap. So even for an infinitely long chain, you do have a significant band gap. Whereas if we look at other sorts of porphyrin-based molecular wires, like this um, edge-fused tape variety, this is more like the cyanins that I was telling you about before, in that the calculated band structure for the infinite chain has now no band gap, so it's a, it's a semi-metal. Um, so we've been measuring the conductance of these sorts of molecules in collaboration with uh, Richard Nichols Group in Liverpool and Nicholas Argrate in Madrid. So the idea is, just, just as I've really explained already, to make a series of, of oligomers of different lengths and measure their conductances to determine this beta factor to see how well these porphyrin-based molecular wires can mediate long-range charge transport, how well they can behave as conductors. Uh, so here are the results for a uh, monomer, dimer, and trimer uh, porphyrin compounds with sulfur N groups. Um, so it's a plot of log of uh, the conductance against distance as you pull the tip away from the surface for one porphyrin, two porphyrin, or three porphyrin. Uh, don't be distracted by this uh, bump at the bottom here. I'll, I'll grade that out. That's just due to uh, noise. It's not a real signal. The thing to focus on is this plateau here. And so you can see that as the molecule becomes longer, the plateau becomes longer. That's reassuring. That tells us we're looking down the length of the molecule. And you can also see that it becomes a, a much lower conductance. So the conductance does decrease by an, about an order of magnitude each time you add a porphyrin unit. Um, so if you plot the um, log of the conductance against the length, you can determine the beta factor. And it's fairly typical. It's similar to the value I showed you for the benzene type compound before at about 
three reciprocal nanometers. But if we compare the um, edge fused porphyrin tapes that I mentioned in the, the band calculations, now if I again hide the noise at the bottom, you can see that the plateaus get longer as you go from monomer to dimer and to trimer, but the conductance hardly changes at all. So the, these are remarkable molecules in that the conductance is almost independent of length, and that, that could make them useful for carrying charge efficiently over uh, a few nanometers. And we're investigating at the moment how much further we can go in terms of length of these molecular wires. And it's interesting to make not just molecular wires that have two terminals, uh, but transistors that have three terminals. So uh, all electronic logic circuits rely on the ability to make a uh, a, a transistor, not just a, a two-terminal device. Um, but it's much more difficult to connect a molecule to three different electrodes. You, you can't get the electrodes close enough without um, short-circuiting them. But, but you can make molecular transistors by having a, a molecule connected to two metal contacts, the source and the drain, and then a bit further away having a gate, um, which can control the charge transport by the electric field. So if you think about it, if you have a, a gate electrode which um, creates an electric field on the molecule, that's going to change the energy levels of the molecule by stabilizing or destabilizing electrons by the electric field, and it can control uh, the, the charge transport between the source and the drain. So you, you can make single molecule transistors. And we do it using uh, graphene for the source and the drain and uh, silicon for the back gate uh, insulated by silicon dioxide. So we, we make these um, um, graphene structures on a silicon wafer. Uh, you make a chip which has got 874 of them. So each of these little squares corresponds to uh, two contact points and a graphene constriction. And then um, in a very controlled way, you can apply a current through this constriction and it, um, and it burns a little gap about one nanometer across just at the center point. So we use electro burning to break the graphene at the center point. So then you have an array of one nanometer gaps, and then you can deposit a molecule onto the junction. Um, and then many of the junctions don't work because we have no control about where the molecule goes, but you can automatically test all of these 874 devices. Uh, and if you're lucky, you find a few that work. Um, and then you can investigate their properties and you can learn a huge amount about the molecule um, from these uh, um, molecular transistors because um, you can look at plots of the uh, source drain voltage, the bias voltage against the gate voltage, where you get these diamond patterns for the different oxidation states of the molecule. And you can also resolve vibrational structure. Um, and um, I'm, I'm not going to talk more about that now, but I just wanted to point out that you can make single molecule transistors, uh, but they are difficult to study uh, and the reproducibility is nothing like what it is for the two terminal connections of measuring resistance. I'd like to turn now, rather than thinking about linear wires, uh, thinking about circular wires. So just as in everyday life, it's often more interesting to look at a, a loop of wire or a solenoid than a straight wire. I think it can be more interesting to look at molecular wires that are in rings or loops rather than straight ones. Um, we've been working a lot on rings of porphyrin-based molecular wires like this cyclic hexamer linked by acetylenes. And we make these using templates. So in this case, the template is a hexadentate, hexapyridyl unit, which coordinates the zinc centers. So the synthesis um, consists of coupling together six of these uh, diphenyl monomers coordinated to the template using a palladium catalyzed oxidative coupling. And the crystal structure just shows that it has a nice regular um, barrel shape as, as I think you'd expect. Uh, the template is still in place there, um, but it doesn't have to be. You can remove it um, by adding acid or by adding a competing amine ligand. Um, so we can make both the template containing and the template free rings. I should say that the template is not pi conjugated to the rest of the system. So all the electronic properties are dominated by um, the peripheral conjugated pathway, the pi system around the edges, not, not the center. Um, so that's a fairly small um, porphyrin nano ring, about um, two and a half nanometers across. We can also make much larger ones. And one way of doing that 
is to use what's known as vernier templating. And you do this by having a mismatch between the number of binding sites on the template and the building block. So if you have a four component building block and a six component template, uh, the template will cyclize any oligomer, which is a multiple of six units. Um, but because our building block is four units, then every, every oligomer will also be a multiple of four. So you form the product, which is the lowest common multiple of four and six, uh, so 12. So you can form the 12 porphyrin ring um, very efficiently. Um, and the crystal structure just confirms that it has this figure of eight shape uh, with two bound templates. Uh, but again, we can take the templates out quite easily, and then it springs into a regular circular shape, uh, as seen by the STM image. So this is an image of these 12 porphyrin nano rings uh, deposited under ultra high vacuum onto a gold surface, and they tend to line up onto the step edge. Um, so you can resolve the porphyrin units, but not, not the individual atoms around the ring. And we can make much larger rings using this uh, vernier templating approach. Uh, these are examples of 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50 porphyrin rings. Um, so it, it's exciting that you can make uh, these molecular wire rings up to 20 nanometers across uh, directly from a fairly simple organic synthesis, not that many steps, and get into the size range of proteins. Um, and something that we're, we're working towards and, and uh, keen to explore is, is connecting up uh, contact to these sorts of molecular wire rings to see how uh, charge can flow around the rings and what sort of electronic properties we can get from uh, wire rings rather than straight wires. So the simplest way to look at charge delocalization around the ring is to oxidize the ring chemically to introduce a positive charge and then investigate whether that charge stays at one place or hops around or coherently is delocalized around the whole ring. Um, and we've used a lot of different techniques to probe charge delocalization in these sorts of nano rings. Um, but probably the simplest way of investigating the charge delocalization is to look at the aromaticity of the systems. And I thought I should just remind you about the, the, the principle of aromaticity in organic chemistry. So if you have a macrocycle which is pi conjugated and it has 4n plus 2 pi electrons, uh, then it should be aromatic by Huckel's rule. And that means that if you put it in an external magnetic field, you induce a ring current, uh, which induces a, um, a magnetic field from the molecule, which opposes the external field inside the ring. So an induced field inside the ring goes in the opposite direction to the external field. So it shields uh, any atoms on the inside of the ring from the external field. And you can see that happening very easily just from the proton NMR spectrum because the proton on the inside here is shielded at minus three ppm, whereas the one on the outside is deshielded at nine ppm. And you can also um, calculate this uh, quite easily um, by what's known as a, a nucleus independent chemical shift calculation. So this is a, a contour plot showing the calculated shielding on the inside of the ring in this 80 nanoline molecule. So it predicts shielding on the inside and deshielding on the outside, just as you see. So that's what you get if you have 4n plus 2 pi electrons. But if you have 4n, in other words, if you have a, a, an even number of electron pairs rather than an odd number of electron pairs, you get the opposite effect. So if you take 18 aniline and you reduce it to the dianion, you have 20 pi electrons. It's anti-aromatic. And you get the opposite effect. So you still have a ring current but it goes in the opposite direction. So it reinforces the external field inside the ring. And this proton, which was at minus three, now comes at almost plus 30. And the one that was at plus nine comes at minus one. Uh, so you can see from the proton NMR that you've got these ring currents and that you can change the direction by changing the charge. And you can also see it from the Nix calculation. Um, the change of color is telling you that it's now deshielded on the inside and shielded on the outside. Um, so porphyrins are aromatic macrocycles. A simple porphyrin monomer is an 18 pi electron system. You get that by counting alternating double and single bonds around this pathway. And you can tell from the NMR that they, they do behave as aromatic systems. Um, whereas if you oxidize them to the dications, they're now 16 pi electron anti-aromatic. You can do the same sort of electron counting uh, as we do around a porphyrin unit, around a whole nano ring. So if you count alternating 
triple and single and double and single bonds all the way around this pathway, you get a circuit of 84 pi electrons, um, which is a 4n um, number. So we'd expect the molecules to be anti-aromatic or non-aromatic. Um, whereas if you were to oxidize it to the six plus oxidation state, which we can do quite easily in solution, then it should have 78 pi electrons and be aromatic. And that's, that's a really simple sort of Huckel's rule, um, uh, simple organic chemist principle, but it's, it's actually a really reliable way of predicting the behavior of these systems. And it matches um, with uh, density functional calculations. So these are the calculated, oops, uh, calculated uh, Nix values showing that in the neutral ring, we have no global ring current, the shielding on the inside and the outside are the same, but in the, in the four plus, um, it's anti-aromatic, it's uh, shielded on the outside and de-shielded on the inside, whereas in the six plus, it's uh, aromatic, shielded on the inside and de-shielded on the outside. And that's just a, a calculated result, but we can see it experimentally. So I'll show you the NMR spectra for this six porphyrin ring with the trihexyl salyl groups on the, on the aryl and a, a six-legged template on the inside. And before I show the different charge states, I'll just show the neutral molecule. So the neutral molecule has a local ring current from the, the, the porphyrin itself is aromatic and that has a ring current. And that's why the alpha proton is coming at about 2 ppm. It's strongly shielded. So normally pyridine would come at about um, between eight and nine ppm, the alpha pyridine and it's shielded to lower chemical shift by the local effect of the porphyrin. But there's no global ring current, and you can tell that because the, the ortho and the ortho prime, which are inside and outside, are almost coincident, and the trihexyl salyls inside and outside, that I color yellow and um, green, are, are coincident. But if you oxidize it to the four plus oxidation state, you now see a huge split between the trihexyl salyls, um, and we can assign them by 2D NMR. And we know that this one at about 4 ppm is, is the one on the inside. So that's telling us that we have um, de-shielding on the inside and shielding on the outside that is anti-aromatic as calculated. And these unusual peaks right up to past 20 ppm are peaks from the template um, that's strongly de-shielded by the anti-aromatic ring current. So that's what you get if you just oxidize it in solution to the four plus. If you carry on to the six plus, you get the opposite behavior. Now you have an aromatic ring current as predicted. The order of the trihexyl salyls is the other way around. And you can see quite a strong splitting between the ortho and the ortho prime, confirming that the inside of the nano ring is shielded. And you can carry on to the 12 plus. In the 12 plus, we no longer have a global ring current. The trihexyl salyls are coincident. But now every individual porphyrin is in its two plus oxidation state and is strongly anti-aromatic. And that's why the alpha pyridine proton is de-shielded up at um, 11 and a half ppm. Um, so just by changing the number of electrons in these nano rings, we can establish global ring currents around the whole perimeter uh, and change their direction by changing the charge. We've looked at this effect in lots of different nano rings. And the largest one that we've looked at so far is this 12 porphyrin ring. Um, and we made this, um, I, well, I showed you the simple of this earlier using the small six-legged template, but you can also make it using this big six-legged template, um, which is actually another example of vernier templating. Um, but the big template here has the advantage that it holds the whole 12 ring in a, in a really regular uh, geometry. Um, and that's just a calculated structure showing how two of these large templates stack inside the ring and enforce this circular geometry. Um, so we synthesized this and um, looked at its NMR spectra in different oxidation states, but unfortunately the NMR spectra was so broad we couldn't really identify whether it was aromatic or not. Um, so we designed a new template which has these trifluoromethyl groups at one position on every leg, because then we can use fluorine NMR uh, and since there's only one fluorine environment, even if it's broad, we should be able to see whether it's shifted upfield or downfield and tell whether there's a global ring current. And the results show that in the six plus oxidation state, you've got um, a, a global aromatic ring current because the fluorine peak is, is shifted to, to, um, to more negative uh, chemical shift. Whereas in the eight plus, it's shifted in the opposite direction. You have a global anti-aromatic ring current and in the 10 plus, uh, again, you have a, um, a global aromatic ring current. Um, 
um, is the 12 plus has hardly any ring current at all. Um, I thought I'd show you some of the raw NMR data uh, that leads to these uh, fluorine and proton NMR spectra. So we do this as a titration where we gradually titrate in an oxidant. And so this is a stack of spectra with increasing amounts of this phenium oxidant. Um, the sharp peaks in the proton NMR here at about 7 ppm are due to the um, reduced oxidant. Um, so they're not particularly interesting, but they allow us to check the amount of oxygen that we've added and we know where we are in the titration by looking at those peaks. And they broaden out as soon as you um, fully oxidize the porphyrin up to the 12 plus because you get electron exchange between the reduced and unreduced theanthrenium. The much more interesting peaks are these ones in the fluorine NMR. Um, you see growing up uh, during the oxidation, you get peaks growing up at 6 plus, 7 plus, 8 plus and 10 plus. You can identify different oxidation states and see how shielded or deshielded they are and thus deduce the global ring currents. An, in an interesting thing about this 12 porphyrin ring is that we can change its geometry. So we can compare the geometry when it's in a circular shape to when it's in a figure of eight shape. And that's interesting because in a figure of eight, you wouldn't expect to be get any induced ring current because the magnetic field passing through one loop would exactly cancel the effect of the magnetic field through the other loop. In other words, um, one loop will induce a field in one direction and the other loop will have the field in the opposite direction, so there's no net induced current. That's what you'd expect for a bit of copper wire in a, in a magnetic field, and it's exactly what we see for the molecules. So we can compare the one that I've just shown you with the large template and these fluorine groups, and we've also made a fluorinated version of the small template so we can look at the fluorine NMR of the different oxidation states. So the figure of eight, um, 12 porphyrin ring, as well as the um, large circular 12 porphyrin ring. And the NMR spectra show you that, that there's really no shift due to any sort of ring current effect in the figure of eight, whereas it is in the large expanded ring. So I think it's nice that that macroscopic argument about the cancellation in a figure of eight does seem to apply to a molecule. Um, and we can also reproduce this computationally. So I've talked about the Nix calculations. Um, these are the um, isotropic, that means in, in all directions, Nix value or just along the z-axis, the Nix zz. And we predict uh, large aromatic and anti-aromatic ring currents for the six plus and eight plus in the open ring, but not in the figure of eight shape. Um, so um, I've shown that we can make rings that are aromatic, which have much more, much larger diameters, much larger numbers of pi electrons than people have predicted uh, in the past. So many textbooks say that aromaticity dies away when you have about um, 22 pi electrons, but this system has uh, 162 pi electrons. And that, that's interesting because there are similar effects to aromaticity seen in mesoscopic metal uh, rings. So if you have a ring of aluminium, uh, as shown here, at low temperature, so the coherence length of the electrons is greater than the circumference, you find that there's a persistent current. It's a, a quantum mechanical feature, very much like a ring current. But one of the differences of these mesoscopic persistent currents is that as you change the external magnetic field, you get an a, a alternation in the induced ring current. So the ring current changes direction as you change the external field. Uh, and no one's seen anything like this in molecules. It, it would be very strange if you did see it. It would be um, like changing the magnetic field from a 400 megahertz to a 600 megahertz NMR machine might change whether the molecule is ar aromatic or anti-aromatic. And the reason it hasn't been seen in molecules is that the flux quantum, the magnetic field required for one of these oscillations is inversely proportional to the area of the molecule uh, so one over R squared. And um, the largest magnetic fields that you can easily get in the lab are about 20 Tesla. And that would require a ring of a, a diameter of about 20 nanometers. And no one's made aromatic rings anything like this that large. Um, but I hope that in the future we will be able to make aromatic rings that meet up with these mesoscopic structures to see whether the same physics applies to both sorts of, of systems. Um, another reason why it's interesting to look at aromaticity in these large rings is that in order to get an aromatic ring current, you must have a coherent wave function around the entire ring. And if you get 
uh, coherent charge transport around the whole ring. It means that if you connect the ring uh, at two points to electrodes, then there'll be wave-like charge transport in two pathways, uh, which could lead to constructive or destructive interference. So we should be able to make uh, a molecular interferometer, uh, which would be a, a very sensitive to any sort of slight difference between the two pathways. It might be a, a delicate sensor and it should be very sensitive to um, electric fields or magnetic fields. Um, so that, that's one direction that we're looking at in the future. Um, so um, that more or less brings me to a close. Um, I hope I've shown you how we can make some unusual uh, nanostructures um, and that, that um, some of them do have some remarkable electronic wire-like properties and that they could be useful components in molecular electronics. Um, just before I stop, I thought I should give you a little bit of an idea of a, uh, a slightly crazy sort of vision for the future. That one of the areas where small metal wires have interesting behavior is in uh, metamaterials. I don't know if you've come across these uh, materials. Um, often they're studied using microwaves, so where the wavelength of the, of the microwaves is like a centimeter. And if you have these um, split ring resonators and you have a periodic lattice of these uh, wire features, you can control the refractive index of the material to, in this case, microwaves. And, and so in principle, you can make um, uh, amazing things like a, um, a, a magic cloak, which completely conceals the contents of a box because it bends light around the inside of the box and then back on its original pathway shown here. So you can, ma you can make a, a disappearing cloak or you can make very strange uh, optical properties if you can engineer uh, the refractive index in this way. And maybe by learning how to make materials out of molecular wires, how to manipulate molecular wires, uh, we'll learn um, ways of making new metamaterials. And e even more speculative, I I'm inspired by these uh, RFID tags that are, they use so widely in, in, in all sorts of applications, which are really just uh, very simple circuits of loops of wire that, that interact with radio waves. And so maybe we could make uh, molecular electronic components that don't have any uh, wide connection to the outside world, but where we can induce currents in loops of molecular wire and, and get some sort of function. Um, but I, I, I'd like to stop there and just thank a lot of people who we've worked with who've done um, the synthesis of the structures that I've told you about and the spectroscopy and physical organic chemistry and also physical measurements. So um, my group doesn't do any STM, well, not in our lab anyway. Um, we sometimes do it with collaborators um, such as Nicholas Agrate and um, um, Richard Nichols shown there. Uh, and these are some of the people who worked on the porphyrin nano rings. Um, and we've, we've been involved in many collaborations. I talked about the work from Peter Beaton's group. Okay, I think that's, that's all. Um, so I don't know if you'd like to ask questions or anything. Oh, brilliant. Thanks so much for the really interesting talk. Um, so we'll take some questions now. So if you want to post them in the chat or if you just raise your hand and um, I'll unmute you. I think everyone um, has access to the chat. I'll just double check. Yeah. I have a question. I was wondering if theoretically you can make these rings very, very large, what's the practical problems for doing it at the moment? Um, we, we could make them much larger than we have. Um, uh, yeah, what are the practical problems? Um, the, the, the template directed synthesis that I showed you um, becomes less selective when you're making larger rings. So the largest ring that we've made is 50 porphyrins. Um, but that was a slight cheat because it was actually, we had a Vienna templated route to a 40 porphyrin ring and we got 50 porphyrin as a byproduct. Um, <laughs> um, and you can separate them quite easily. Um, we haven't tried to make any bigger than 50. Um, I'm sure we could, but we wouldn't be able to make them very selectively, um, but we could separate them. It, um, gel permeation chromatography allows you to separate molecules like that pretty efficiently. Um, but uh, I'm interested in the properties of the rings, and I think that you tend to lose coherence uh, probably, probably long before 50. So you, you, 
you lose um, the, the wave function doesn't extend over the whole thing. Um, so you, you know, if, 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 the, if the different parts of the molecule are not really talking to each other, then you don't gain anything by joining them together. Um, although they may talk in different ways. So there may be some properties that would change if you made a hundred porphyrin ring and others where it would just be like a polymer where it doesn't matter. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, my chat's not working properly. Is, is there any questions in the chat? Or? Um, I can't see any, but I did oh. have a question. Oh. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, sorry, I wrote it down. Let me find it again. Um, so with the wires, does the metal have to be zinc? So how does different metals no. conductivity? Um, we have actually investigated lots of metals other than zinc, but zinc is such an easy, in a way, boring metal. I mean, it's a sort of D10 transition metal that... Uh, it, it, the NMR is all easy because it's not bad magnetic. It, it binds quite strongly, but not so strongly you can't get it out if you want to. Um, and, it, and it's only got one oxidation state, so you haven't got any problems with getting oxidized. It's just a very boring sort of easy metal. Um, but we have um, worked a lot with copper because you, you can do EPR experiments on copper because they're, they're paramagnetic. Um, and we're working at the moment on lanthanides. So you can put uh, dysprosium, um, well, any, any lanthanide really, but um, terbium and gadolinium, we've put, we've, not into nano rings yet, but into linear wires. I think you could probably could put them into the rings. But I think almost any element in the periodic, any metal in the periodic table, you probably could put into those structures. Oh, well, thank you. And we have a question in the chat from Joe Manning. Um, are you able to demetallate the porphyrin rings? Yes. Yes, um, we normally do it with trifluoroacetic acid. Um, but yeah, we, we, we routinely demetallate them, um, sometimes to remove the templates. It, one of the easiest way of removing the template is to take the metal out and then the template just falls out and then you can put, you may put the same metal back in again or a different metal. So yeah, that's, that's straightforward. I was muted. And um, Professor Price also has a question. Yes, but it's a beautiful and fascinating looking molecules. I was interested in the role of the template. You know, it's very clever where you went from the circular to the um, double loop system. And I presume you could, by making different template molecules, do quite a variety of different shapes. Yes. Um, but how much does that template and the extent to which your molecule is bent affect its conductivity? Uh, you know, what happens if you remove the templates? Do they all completely collapse? You, you, know, you have a simple idea that aromaticity um, tends to keep things nice and planar, but you're actually bending them a bit. Yeah, um, the interesting thing is that when you charge them, they have a really strong preference for being all the porphyrins coplanar or neighboring porphyrins coplanar. So if you charge a ring, it adopts essentially the same cylindrical conformation as it would if it had a template. And the, the barrier to rotation becomes much higher when they're charged. So we've, we've just about to publish a paper where we measure the, the rotational barriers in the rings as a function of charge. Um, and, and yeah, you can measure the ring currents in them with, without the template in the same way as with the template, and the confirmations are quite similar. Do you know where the charge resides? Um, not, not really, but well, I mean, we, we've, we've looked at the EPR of the radical cations, um, so we know a bit about where the spin density resides, which is more or less where the charge resides, which is fairly uniformly spread out. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, um, and the, the fact that the barrier to rotation increases when you charge them, to me, says that as you, as you try to rotate one porphyrin, then the charge sort of redistributes onto the other ones. And, and it's much more favorable to have the charge uniformly spread out over all of them. But yeah, so we, we don't know that much detail, but yeah. And you were beautifully frank about how many the problem of getting the molecules into the right place to make devices and how many of, they, uh, how many of those devices fail if you put the molecule um, between the tips. But on the other hand, you know, the high technology that went into developing the silicon chip 
Well, to hazard a guess of um, how long it would take to be able to manufacture things if people were really convinced that the properties were worthwhile? Um, I'm not sure. I, um, I don't know. Um, I mean, single molecules are, are, are frankly difficult, aren't they? Because everyone is different. Um, the, the one sort of bit of hope that I have is from the um, nanopore technology for, for um, DNA sequencing and things, where you have just a single pore, which you can do so, so much useful operations on, and you, you don't get problems of it sort of behaving stochastically. So, I mean, that, I know that's completely different, but that the example of, of, um, of um, nanopores being used as um, single molecule level to do something useful suggests that practical molecular electronics might be able to work. Um, we, we found it really frustrating, to be honest, trying to, to make single molecule transistors. Um, um, I, if I'd known how frustrating it would be, perhaps we'd never have started because um, it, 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 you can try to optimize it really carefully and instill the success rate. You have a chip of um, 800 gaps and really if you get three or four which behave the same way, you're doing very well. <laughs> it's frustrating. Yeah, must be have some very dedicated PhD students. Yeah. I mean, you, you can get so much information from them when they do work well, that that's, um, but it's hard to get enough devices that you can say it's really a characteristic of the molecule, not that particular junction. Thank you. Um, we've got a couple of questions in the chat. Um, so as a follow-up question from the question about, um, let me just see if I can go up. So this is from Joe Manning. As a follow-up, does demethylation change the inductive properties of the rings? That's a good question. We, we haven't looked at the electronic properties of the free bases. We, we've only really treated them as intermediates to put different metals in. Um, I don't know. I don't know, I'm, I'm not sure. The, the homo lumo gap of a free base porphyrin is a bit smaller than a methylated one, but I, I'm not sure it would make very much difference. The symmetry, of course, is lower as well because you, you've desymmetrized it by putting two hydrogens in the diagonal, so everything gets a little bit messier. And um, uh, the final question from Harry Lee, has there been work on trying to utilize the light capturing potential of these molecules? Question mark, develop more complex porphyrin sensitized solar cells? Um, we've looked a lot at the photophysics of them and we've looked at how they mimic the natural light harvesting. You get rings of chlorophylls in, in many sorts of plants and they, they do mimic those. Um, so you get excited state, um, rapid migration around the rings, just like in the, the natural light harvesting systems. But we haven't uh, tried to exploit that in making photovoltaic devices. Um, I'm sure you could, we, we just haven't really gone in that direction. Brilliant. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for your questions and, and thank you for, for answering them. It's been a really interesting discussion. Um, I'm going to pass over to uh, Kiara now. I think we're going to go into some breakout rooms. So um, if there's any further questions or if anyone just wants to stick around and have a general chat, um, that'd be brilliant. Thanks, Kiara. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, it was really interesting. It was great to learn about all the nano rings.